praise the Lord. Like Tracy said, I'm glad Brother Ivan, his family is with us today, and then they're going to be here tonight and Wednesday night, so praise the Lord for that. So y'all give him a big old hand. Brother Ivan, come on up. You and... Hello. Oh, there you go. Wow, that's a good sound. Thank you, sir. Is that me? Good morning. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Oh, go ahead, darling. Me? Yeah. This is my wife, Kimberly Tate. Give her a hand, everybody. <laughs> and she'll take it from here. Good morning. Good morning. How are we getting wider and wider and wider? And Laura stays the same. <laughs> what is that? It's beautiful. She's Thank you for the worship this morning. So gorgeous. I have a, you know, it, I had this incredible word prepared. It's full of conviction, full of tears. But then I realized the church I'm preaching to, and you all are so perfect. I mean, it's just going to just roll off you. So I decided to show you a video instead. Esmeralda grew up on the streets of Guatemala. Her father and her mother would sell her and her oldest sister for labor in the streets and also into prostitution. Esmeralda was used as a very young girl to work on the streets, to beg on the streets, and to try to make money for her family. She was very sick from the time she was very young. When the case of their abuse came to the ears of the judges, they rescued Esmeralda and her sister, and they sent them to a hospital for recovery. There they found that Esmeralda actually had spina bifida, and they put her on a very heavy-duty, intense medication, which stole all of her life, all of her joy, and all of her energy. We gathered together a group of leaders and pastors at the orphanage. We laid hands on Esmeralda, we anointed her with oil, and we prayed and believed God for a miracle healing. Our doctors, with the advice and counsel of each other, took her off of the current medication that she was on. And we did a three-week trial period of just prayer, anointing her in oil, and blessing her little body. When we took her back to the doctor, a miracle had happened. They checked all the case files, they did all the blood work, they looked through all the information and they could not find any trace of spina bifida in her body. She had been 100% healed, she was 100% whole, and from that day in 2013 until this, she has never had a reoccurrence of that sickness ever in her life. so much for partnering with us. We thank you so much for saying that this life matters. Because at Casa Angelina, it is a place of love and healing where every life matters. for partnering with us. Thank you for partnering with us. That is just one story of the many, many stories at Casan Helena, and you give so much to it to the children, to the staff, to everyone there. And 
we really wanted to share Esmeralda's story with you. You know, Kasan Helena is a very rocky place. I don't know if you've been there, but you know, when you go to the beach, I'm going to give you this illustration. And you want to see life. You want to see all the little fishies. You want to do all of that. You don't go to the beach. Where do you go? You go to the rocky places because that's where all the babies are born. That's where the fishies go to hide from the big sharks that are just out there in the clear. It's a noisy place because when you go to listen to waves, you go to the rocky places and they it coming in and going out. It's very noisy. But there's lots of life there. That's where the prayer happens. That's where the preparation happens. That's where all the new life is born. That's the safety place. But it isn't a calm, easy, no problems place. No, there's a lot of currents there. There's a lot going on all the time because each life matters. Every one of these little kiddos that have been discarded, that have been told that they aren't worth anything except for extra money for the family and prostitution, they, their lives matter, and God is calling them to more and more, and God has a plan for their lives. But their life is no more important than your life. And this is a noisy church. This is a rocky church. This is a hard place where we get barnacles washed off us, and we make noise to the Lord as the currents come in and the currents try to pull us out. This is a church of preparation. You know, we're, all, we're such wiggly people, just like fish. We're so wiggly all the time. We can't just be still. We got to wiggle, and we're always looking out there. Hmm, wish I was out there. Out there is the freedom. Out there is the big blue. Out there is the sparkly waters. Out there are the sharks, are the predators, are the... Right? So before we go out there, you know, God always told us to go out there to get them to bring them back. He never sent us out alone. He always said, bring them back to a place of safety. So if you're ever, you know... We have kiddos. We have one of our kiddos that grew up at Casa and Helena just really wanted to go out there. Oh, he's been wiggling for a couple years. He's about 17, and oh, he's wiggling. He's wiggling. Finally, he told the judge, I got to go out there. I'm going to go live with my dad that abused me, left me. <laughs> Two weeks later, we get a phone call. Please, can I come back? How can I come back? I didn't know what out there looks like. I didn't know. And of course, we love him, and we know that he, he's just learning. It's experiences. It's what happens. But never forget that the rocky places, the hard places are home. They're the good places. They're the safe places. That's where we change and grow. That's where we mature. And always be grateful for your local church for your pastor and his wife, for each other in this church. This is where it all happens. Bless you in Jesus' name. I got this one, babe. Here. Thank you. I got this. There you go. All right, that was good. Well, I guess that could be it right there. Praise the Lord. Uh, good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Praise the Lord. That was Esmeralda, and she's a miracle. And uh, that was a beautiful presentation. They did a good job on that video. Yeah, Gavin did that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, great. Let's go to our Bibles, if we could. And let's go crazy. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you would. And... As we get into that this morning, uh, let me just say thank you to the church and thank you to Pastor Robert for being a, a true friend to all these orphans and all these children and all of you that are in the church that constantly help us. We got the two vans. They're actually at the orphanage now. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll show those pictures tonight. I think I have those pictures. Um, 
Yeah. So thank you for those two nice new vans that we got that we really needed. And they're really great. And, you know, when we think about friends and who our friends are, we think about this church. We think about Robert and Laura and all of you that we know. And, you know, we thank God for, for you all the time. You're, you're above normal in your affection and compassion and dependability. You know, it's really a big strength to Kimberly and I and my family. Um, every time I come, I always feel like, wow, I didn't spend enough time there. So this time I said, you know what, <laughs> we're just staying the whole week. And I said, I'm bringing Kimberly, I'm bringing my daughter, Abby. Why don't you stand up, Abby? This is my youngest daughter, Abby. And Abby uh, has a beautiful grandson of mine named Zaya. Give him a hand. He's really, really good looking. And, uh, you know, he's in the nursery. But Abby will be ministering with me tonight and giving part of her testimony of our journey in life. And uh, Kimberly, of course, will be ministering with me as well in all the services. But uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you for that. Really appreciate it. It means a lot a lot to us. We don't take it for granted. Those kind of friends are not a lot. And matter of fact, I don't think I have any friends like Robert. Truly. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, I have a lot of friends, but I don't have a friend like Robert, you know. And, and by that, I don't mean just unusual human being, <laughs> but, but I mean loyal, faithful, loving, truthful, honest, dependable, reliable. You know, I just feel like, you know, to me, you guys own Casa and Helena. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you, you own Casa and Helena. Much of what's there, you put there, and, and that's something that's worth, uh, you know, thanking God that he was able to make that happen. Praise the Lord. So for the time that I have, let's go in there to the Bible. Praise the Lord. I didn't speak to Robert about what I was going to speak about. I mean, I norm never do, but but um, um, he mentioned, "Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us." And I want to talk to you about this phrase: "Love is the answer." Praise the Lord. Would you say that to everybody around you? Say, "Love is the answer." Whatever you're going through in your life today, whatever problem you're facing. The answer to that problem is the love of God, a particular type of the love of God. Not every face of the love of God is the same. Sometimes, for example, to show love, you have to separate yourself from someone. It is the most loving thing to do. Sometimes to show the love of God, you have to stand in front of a bullet and actually die to save someone who you may not even know. To other people, the love of God would be to empty your bank account and give it to a widow or to a poor person or to feed a family or to buy them a car or to pay off their house. That's the other face of the love of God. To another person and another time, the sign of the love of God is to just suffer in pain while somebody mistreats you that you cannot get rid of. That's also the love of God. Sometimes the love of God is to eat right so you don't hurt your children by dying young. That's the love of God. To other people, the love of God, and in another situation, the love of God is for you to stop cussing at home so that your children want to serve God instead of run from him. That's the love of God. So God's love is not just one little mushy little soft thing, the love of God has many faces, and those faces you and I have to learn, and we also have to perfect those faces. We have to know to do the parts of the love of God that are not easy to do, that are hard to do, yet they are the right thing to do, and they produce the right result, and they solve the problem. Sometimes you just have to be faithful when you're not loved at home. You don't feel the love of God from your family. Nobody's loving you. Nobody's being patient with you. Nobody is thinking about you. Nobody is taking care about, uh, of you. Nobody is giving you the, the attention that you need. 
But you have to just be faithful day in and day out until God does his miracles. That is the love of God. So the love of God is the answer. In your marriage, the love of God is the answer. Two people that walk in love can solve any problem. Praise God. Two people that walk in love can solve any problem. Love is the answer. You know the cliches that God is love, and that has become an empty cliche. But in reality, if you know how to connect to the love of God, it gives you superpowers. Praise God. For example, is, isn't it a superpower to be nice to people that are cussing at you? How many of you think that's a superpower? Because you know you've got the fist power, but then you've got the love of God power. Anybody can be mean, carnal, cruel, brutal, and violent. But it takes something that you don't have to be able to treat people the way Jesus would treat them when you know you can't do that. It's not in you to do it. I've told you the story before, but a young man was driving in his car drunk, and he killed uh, a girl, an 18-year-old girl. And she was uh, a miracle child of an elderly couple. And it was the only daughter they had, and this uh, drunk young man uh, runs into her and kills her. And he goes to prison. And then this elderly couple... And, and I say this because this is not something that I actually can comprehend doing. Me personally, I cannot actually comprehend doing it. But this elderly couple goes to prison with a Bible in their hands and says, we want to see so-and-so. And they bring out this young man and they say, we are the parents of the girl that you killed. In tears, weeping uncontrollably. And he was just like paralyzed. He didn't know what to do. And they just came back and came back and came back. And then they said, could we do a Bible study with you? And he just didn't know how to say no. He didn't know what to do. He's totally lost, but he didn't know what to do. So he just went through the motions. And in the process, he gets saved by these, this couple coming and doing Bible studies with him. He's in there for whatever amount of time. And one day they come back, and they had grown very close. And he, they said to him, we were wondering if you'd let us adopt you. You know, we were wondering if you'd let us adopt you and make you our son. And they adopted this young man who is now a pastor. And I have the privilege of being his pastor. And it's very powerful. He has this great church. He's just a, he's just a complete, he's a different person because he's been touched by something that's not of this earth. Something in these elderly people was not of this earth. They tapped into something that you and I, in our natural thinking, you know, couldn't imagine that. I, I, I just can't imagine it. If somebody hurt my daughter, you know, I think my reaction would be like most of our reactions, a lot of hate and a lot of rage and a lot of revenge and a lot of how do I get even with this person. That would be, my, I think, my initial reaction. But these people had something, ladies and gentlemen, that is not of this earth. It is a divine peace of God that is operating on the inside of their life. What good is our life if we're just like every lost person in the world except we go to church? And what good is a church if it's just normal? You understand, look around at this church. There's not 10,000 people here. There's not 3,000 people here. Yet you give hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to rescue orphans and widows and feed the poor. Because something in you is divine. That's the love of God. Robert goes down there and he sees Esmeralda. He gets to know her. Laura goes down there. They see the kids. Some of you go down there. You bond with these children. And then, like all of us that are grandparents, how many of you are grandparents? You have your wallet in, in your hand when your grandchild shows up, you just, you want a car at seven years old here, go buy a Mercedes Benz or a BMW. You want an airplane here? Because you have something in there that's not naturally understood, 
but it drives you. It's in your DNA. It's part of your, the cells of your body. You know, and this is human. This is human. The mafia has that. <laughs> but we need it for people that hate us. We need it for a husband that's a lousy husband, a wife that won't shut up, a children that act bad and disrespect us and dishonor us. We need it for our bosses who are brutal and tyrannical and cheating and for people that steal from you and rob from you and, and take away things that you've worked a long time for. We need it so that we don't become who they are by being converted by the cruelty and coldness that's inside them. Matthew 24, 12 says, In the last days, the love of many people will grow cold because iniquity will abound. When you're around a lot of mean people, you're in danger of being converted. When you have somebody in your life that's cussing you out, lying to you, trying to hurt somebody in your family, you're in, you're in danger of being converted and made like them. When you're driving down that highway and people throw the finger at you and your ego is ignited and you don't know how to check yourself and, and say, wait a second, you're evangelizing me. You are trying to evangelize me. If I throw the finger back, I am being converted by Satan. Satan in that person is evangelizing me. Now I'm just acting like Satan wants me to act because somebody touched my ego or my pride or some vain part of me that says, if you mess with me, I will put you down like a, a wretched dog that you are. And then your pride takes over and you puff up. And you're like a rooster. But the Holy Spirit doesn't work with roosters. The Holy Spirit works with doves. We're harmless as a, a dove. Harmless as a dove. What that means is we don't get run over. It means that we're not converted to become evil like the evil people we have to meet every day. We have superpowers. The superpower is that we're not convertible. We cannot be changed by evil. We're locked into the Holy Spirit. We're locked into God. And it's the Holy Spirit that determines how we act, what comes out of our mouth, how we treat people. If you put love into your family, sooner or later, your children that are not serving God are going to serve Him. They can't resist it. The real love of God cannot be resisted. Genuine love cannot be resisted. Authentic love cannot be resisted. Once you know the faces of love and how to treat a homosexual son or homosexual daughter or how to treat, you know, somebody on drugs or somebody that's off, you know, doing things. Once you know how to love those people and they know it's the love of God and they say, how are you loving me like this? Why are you not persecuting me? Why are you not rejecting me? Why are you opening your arms to me? Why are you treating me like I'm the best thing that has ever lived and ever existed? When I treat you so bad, when I steal from you, when I disrespect you, when I talk to bad about you and don't treat you well. What, what, what is going on? Because if we don't have a touch of heaven, then love is not the answer. Because your human love has limits. It has limitations. It's going to run out. There will be a person that enters your life who will offend you so badly that they will literally make you a criminal. And, and you are going to be in, in danger of saying, I don't give a blankety blank what God thinks, man thinks, or anybody thinks. I'm getting even with this person, and I'm doing this. Or else you can just not care and let people do whatever they want to everybody. That's not the love of God either. Praise the Lord. I mean, I know that some of us are old, but if somebody's beating up a woman, by law, you have to actually jump in there. Or they're going to throw you in jail for letting the woman get beat up. And if you don't love that woman, you're going to try to find an escape, especially if you don't breathe well. <laughs> because you know as soon as you go like this, <laughs> it takes real love to say, I'm willing to die to prevent this abuse, which I am required to do.
Praise the Lord. There are men and women here, probably more women than men, packing today. And if anybody would try to hurt any of us, they're all going to pull out their packing gear and end whatever's going on. Some of them possibly will die for some of you that they do not know. And I will be grateful if I'm one of the ones that survive. But I would hope that I would be one of the ones that stood in front of those bullets and didn't even have a second thought. I know if my little grandson was right there and a lion walked in that door, my natural reaction would be to jump in the mouth of the lion so he can chew on me while, you know, my little grandson is rescued by somebody rather than hide under a chair and, you know, squeal. But rather, it's the love of God that makes you a hero. It's the love of God that makes you supernatural. It's the love of God that makes you do things that are not natural. And if you don't have this in your home, or you don't have this in your family, Satan will come and devour you. He will come and chew you up. He will come and rip you to pieces. He will tear up your family because... One of you, whoever it may be, because it only takes one, one of you is actually surrendering to Satan. You are saying things that only he would say. You are treating people in ways that only he would treat them. You are being cold-blooded, cruel, mean, verbally abusive, physically rejecting, emotionally rejecting, because there's no love of God. You have an agenda. People without love have agendas. They want to accomplish a goal. They want money, they want power, or they want control, or they want influence, they want something. But the whole reason you and I are here in church, ladies and gentlemen, of the jury, the reason we're here in church is not for a bunch of religion. Who, who the heck wants that? I was raised in religion, and I was meaner than a junkyard dog. I was so terribly afraid of God killing me as a little boy because I would lie to the priest when I did the confession. I just make up sins. I'll tell you that confessional is a scary place, man. When you're a little kid, you're there and you're hoping you can remember the right way to say it. Oh yeah, I cussed at my mother. I cussed at the dog. I kicked the dog. I did this. I mean, I just invented things. Because I didn't want to go in there without coming out loaded up with some powerful prayers and things, you know, man. And then I started skipping confession. My mom would put me in the line and I'd go to the line and go all the way back and all the way back and then come out and she'd be waiting. Oh, did you do your confession? Yeah, 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 I did it, did it. Then I felt bad for lying to my mother, you know. It is the love of God that is the answer. You and I need the love of God, ladies and gentlemen, because you're really not anybody to admire if you're not a loving person. I, I, I want to love everybody and respect everybody, but I really don't admire everybody. To admire a person, you have to know they've gone through a death walk. They've, they've literally walked the roads of crucifixion and death because they want to please God and they love God so much and they feel God's love in their life so much. They just want to be like Jesus in their lives. Last year, at some point, um, I was feeling bad feelings towards something I remember, but the Holy Spirit spoke very clearly to me and, and he said, hate is how you make Satan your pastor. Now, who is it in your life that has the power to make you hate them? Who is that person? Or who are those people? Because, you know, once you get more than one, you've got a wolf pack now. Or a hyena pack. That's even worse. Let's all say it together. Love is the answer. And it's a powerful, behold, let us love one another, for love is from God. Everyone who loves his, is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, 
Isn't that a powerful thing? The one that does not love does not know God. So actually, you and I giving a human being enough power to make us hate them is idolatry. It means that we have made this person or these people so powerful in our lives that they have taken over the control of our life, which is the job of the Holy Spirit. We have made them so powerful in our lives that they now control the way we feel all day long, how we think, and what we say. That is called idolatry, worshiping in the negative someone's imperfections. It's the love of God, ladies and gentlemen, that makes our homes warm. It's the love of God that makes our homes a house of healing. It's the love of God that makes you repent and apologize. Because as you know, some of you are not really good at saying I'm sorry. Because you always think, well, it's, they've done worse things than I have. Why should I apologize? They should apologize first, then I'll apologize. Sometimes we are so set on getting even with a person that we don't care what God thinks or what God wants. But just remember that to diminish a person is to diminish yourself. So would you look at somebody next to you, right or left, and say, you need to be famous? Say, you need to be famous for loving me. Would you pay off my house? Come on, let's get on a roll. Would you pay off my car? Let's go. Would you pay off my children? I'm still paying on them. You know, one wedding can cost you $30,000 if it's the right child. They won't settle for anything less. You know, some children will have a wedding in a barn and be happy. They don't care. But another child, what, what is this? I'm not going to have a wedding in a barn. I need a quartet. I need fountains where there's no water. Bring it in. Bust it in. Everybody's different. So love is the answer for every problem, for every need, for every desire, for every idea, for every relationship, and for every victory. Love is going to be the answer. Praise the Lord. And I, I like this reality that man measures success by how much money we make, but God measures success by how many ugly people we can make beautiful. See, the love of God is evangelistic. It actually, it, it, it starts working on a person, and it may take 10 or 15 years, or it may be instant, but it's consistent. The love of God is consistent in the face of rejection. And you know, that's a hard one. When you give love to somebody and they just throw it back in your face or they, you know, criticize you, it's very hard to go back to that again and try it again because they just slapped your hand away. But that's the way the love of God is. The love of God is not managed by other people's behavior. When God's love loves, it just keeps loving whether you spit on it or slap it or cuss at it or reject it. It is not managed by other people's imperfections. It is a, it is a, a divinity all of its own, and it cannot be touched by other people's evil. Our flesh can, our pride can, and that's why we get in trouble. But why do you go to church, ladies and gentlemen? Why are you in this building today? Because you know you have a need for something divine to enter your carnal, regular, ugly life. Or because you have so many beauties that God has given you now that you have been addicted to it and you want more. Or because you feel freedom of some kind. You never felt it anywhere else and now you actually feel that freedom and you say, I want more of this freedom. I've been free from this and this and this, but I've got three or four other areas where I'm still, you know, I'm still like a little bit too much, too satanic. You know, a little bit too much, too much carnality 
in my life. And I speak this to you because, you know, and I, I don't want to use this word too you know, flippantly, but I can speak for my wife and myself that we truly love this church, truly. And like we just read, we do not love because we didn't love first. And that's the best way for me to say it. We didn't love first. You did. You did. And you love consistently. I think if I was to die and Kim was to die and Robert was still alive, that he would just keep doing it because he's not doing it for me, although he is doing it for me. But he's doing it for those children. You're doing it for those children. Do you think God does not notice one single time when you are kind to a person that is so rude to you and mean and rejects you? Do you not know how heaven celebrates that kind of behavior? And says, well, where did you get that? How are you able to do that? You know, I had a mother, and I'll never forget this. Uh, I came home to visit her. I wasn't, I wasn't saved, uh, so I didn't come home to visit her. But anyway, I was in the car with her at some point, And one of her relatives had stolen her grave where, where she's supposed to get buried next to her mother. And some other relative that lives nearby died and buried, or her husband died and buried him there. Just stole the graveyard because our family had our own grave thing, whatever. Whatever that's called. Yeah, yeah, but there's lots of them. Yeah, there was like a hundred different ones, and they were all for different relatives. They'd been dying there forever. But <laughs> and my mother had one next to her mother. And then I found out who it was that did it, and I said, Mom, what are you, what? Are, they, she buried her husband there? That's not his grave, you a grave thing, um, grave. And she said, well, it's not worth getting upset about. I said, oh, you don't have bad feelings? She said, no, I don't have bad feelings at all. I'm going to die. Bury me wherever you want. And this is an unsaved woman. I never heard my mother raise her voice or talk bad about any single person. My whole life. And this is an unsaved woman. By the time she got saved, I mean, it was just, you know, a whole different ball game. Now, some of you are already nice. Be without Jesus, you're nice people. But some of us, we are not nice people. We are not nice without Jesus, and we are not nice with him. You literally need to have an encounter with God or you're going to be a person that nobody loves. And if you ever want to be happy, you need to be loved by a lot of people. And, and uh, you know, I'm not flattering you or brown-nosing you or things like that. Sorry about that. But it's really true. I come here and I told Kimberly, I said, Kimberly, if we move, I want to move to Utopia. I told her that this morning. I said, look at all these gray-haired people. I think we fit right in here. <laughs> I said, look at Robert's face. Look at Dwayne's face. Dear God, I think we, you know, I could maybe grow a beard, a white beard, and, and fit in with all these guys. <laughs> Long hair. And, praise God. And I've said it to her like three or four times. She says, I don't know if our children have the same revelation. <laughs> they like to be out with humans. <laughs> but, you know, the love of God breaks down when you and I stop spending time with God. I have realized that there are people I cannot love without God. And there are situations I cannot overcome without God. And there are things about me Things about me that I cannot love without God's help. I actually cannot love myself in some things. I look at myself and I'm ashamed that I'm like that. And I cannot love myself. And I do a lot of good stuff. I don't know what to say. I mean, every week hundreds of people get saved. Miracles happen, all that. But I don't know. I guess we're all the same way. 
If you don't have the love of God, you can't even love yourself. Now, you can be full of pride and vanity and all that stuff, say, I'm cool, I'm the coolest, walk around, you know, all that foolishness. But, but once you realize that's empty, worthless vapors of deception, and you really need God's love to love certain people and to be worth anything, because the kingdom of God is all about love. If you have value to any other person, it's in your ability to treat them with respect and honor, whether they deserve it or not. What is going to heal this town? What is going to heal this town and the alcoholics in this town? I mean, maybe you can count them on one hand, because there's only, what, 300 people in the town? But then you got other bushes and woods out there where people are living that, you know, only Chad meets as he's digging wells out there. Oh, I didn't know there were people out here, man. They've been out here for years. And there's a growing out there, like communities, invisible communities, possible, possibly. I'm, I'm going off there. Yeah, get me back. <laughs> I just think it's cool because when we're driving around, we don't know what we're going to find around here. It's always like a spectacular thing, you know. I left Robert's house, and two giant pigs were out there, big, huge. And one of them got to the middle of the road, and so I was driving, and he just stayed in front of me, so I bumped him. And he just kept going, and he was gigantic, I mean, huge. I know this is exaggerating, but he, to me, at that moment, he looked like a rhino. <laughs> and this is how I've presented that story since that day. It was a rhino. It was above my hood, and I kept bumping the thing. Now, if you went back with me, and actually, it may have been a little bit smaller. Evangelistically speaking. So, let's end with these thoughts. You're not going to be happy if you aren't loved by people. You will shrivel up like a grape. And you will die inside. And no amount of religion is going to get you out of that. And most likely, you're not just going to find a bunch of people that are going to love you for no reason at all. It's just not probably going to happen. People are not just going to show up to your door and say, hey, we're here to love you. You're a mean, mean, you know, bore. It's not going to happen. You're actually going to have to love people. And from that behavior, you will literally create a garden and a harvest of people who actually sincerely care about you. Because doesn't it say that it was God that loved us first? And it's because God loved us first that we're now able to love him back. And that's the recipe. You will not be happy if you cannot love people who are not lovable. You simply will not be happy. You will not be happy with yourself. I had a father-in-law. My original father, biological father, I only knew till seven, seven years old or eight years old, something like that. And uh, he was a man that came down, an architect man that came down to the Rio Grande Valley where I was raised and uh, was married but was separated from his wife and then met my beautiful mother and, and then... Uh, had me, but they were not legally married. Now, my mom told me I made him marry me, but it was in Mexico. You know, it was illegal, but at least, you know, she had some kind of dignity about it. And, uh, and he gave her a big diamond ring, and she always wore it, and she would always tell me her father was my favorite, and, you know, of her three husbands, and, uh, which they all died mysteriously. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, she was married at 14 years old. I mean, that's really young. Yeah. So, and I didn't blame her. My gosh, whatever. But, you know, so he, he left, and that put hate in there. Then she marries this truck driver, and uh, this was a true pig. This was a pig of a man. Have you ever known that, any pig of men? This was a pig of a man. So... Um, 
he threw up on me two, three times while I was sleeping as a kid and said, oh, it was an accident. I thought you were the restroom, you know, and just hated me, basically. Uh, long story short, I get saved at, at 17. The first person God tells me to, to talk to is him and, I, and, and to forgive him. And we had just had a fight uh, the year before. Some, I was in ninth grade, I think. And, um, and it was an ugly thing, you know. And I hurt, I hurt him very badly. But, but, and then we didn't speak again ever. We never spoke. We never, ever, ever spoke. But uh, he slept on the couch for many years. But um, I remember when I got saved and I, I felt here, I need to tell him I, I forgive him. And I need to ask for forgiveness. And he was sitting on his recliner, a very big man, and um, watching TV. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, I, I met God underneath this, a tree. And, and now I have God inside me. And he told me to come and tell you that I forgive you and to forgive me for what I did to you. And he just began to shake you know, laying there, his stomach, it just was shaking, and he was shaking like this, and crying very, very strongly, just like that, crying. And uh, he said, you know, I, I met Jesus when I was 13. And then I went in the Navy, and I lost him. And I've never been able to get him back. And our relationship was healed. At that, at that moment, it just was healed. And and then he, you know, went got divorced from my mom and went off and, and died and things. But but you know, love is standing next to you right now, asking to be invited in to an area of your life where all you can feel is death and defeat. And you know, I cannot fix this. So God has to fix it, and the love of God has to fix it. And that's why we come to church. We come to church to meet with God, to meet God, and to have God come into our lives and take over those places where pride is in control, ego is in control, selfishness is in control, laziness is in control, revenge is in control, and the worst one of all is pain, pain and hurt. What a powerful evangelist pain is. It'll, it'll literally put you in prison. It'll destroy your entire home, wreck it to pieces and rip everybody up that you blame for all your pain. It will tear your life to pieces. And if you do not find a way to get rid of your pain, which the only place I have ever found is at the feet of Jesus, talking to God, crying out to God, and asking God to convert me into a true Christian person that in spite of the pain can have the graces of God, the many graces of God flow into that area of life and, and begin to heal and to restore. And I think Kim and I can testify in our marriage how many, many times we have needed the help of God in our marriage. Isn't that true, babe? I mean... Basically, you have needed the, <laughs> the, love, the love of God for me. <laughs> I wish that wasn't true. My pride said, I wish that wasn't true. But we've been married 42 years, and we barely made it some years. I mean, in all honesty, we barely made it, you know. I mean, it was God. All Jesus. I mean, people don't know those things, you know, but it's true. I mean, we're normal people. There are no super preachers, and if you, you think you, there are, you're deceiving yourself. When they go home, everything is the same as with you, except they either have the glorious presence of God, the love of God, the wisdom of God, the maturity of God, the beauty of God, the sweetness of God, and all those things that change everything. Or they're, they have to deal with all the flesh that they walk in. So I don't know what you're going through, but love is the answer. Love doesn't make you weak. Love makes you strong. You know, Jesus is the strongest man that ever lived. 
Because love, true love, loves every person of every color. Amen. Equally the same. Glory. There's no there's no difference to love. When love looks at a man or a woman, it doesn't care if the man is good or bad. The love of God is unconditional. It has no bias. So, there you go. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes this morning, whatever time it may be, 12, 12 11. Um, and let's ask God to baptize us in the love of God. Say, if you're going to be famous for something, don't be famous for being a witch and cursing people, and gossiping about people, and talking bad about people. Don't be famous for being an alcoholic or selfish person. If we're going to be famous, let's be famous for being outrageously loving. Let's do that. Let's pick that life. Praise the Lord. I'm asking God right now that wherever there is hate, in your family, that love will come in. Wherever there is rejection, that love will come in. Wherever you have felt the hatred of your family and it has hurt you, that you will receive right now uh, the love of God. That wherever you have fa felt that you were a failure to people that love you and you can't love them back and you want to, but you just can't, that God would baptize you in his love today. And that you would get the baptism of love. Just like you got baptized in water. And just like you got baptized in the Holy Spirit. That you will be baptized in the love of God. That you will be such a loving person. That you will literally become like walking medicine. Like a hospital to the unwanted and unloved. Because the truth is how many of us have a problem loving little orphans. Hardly anyone. It's not hard for me to love these children. It's not like some big deed. Anybody can love these children, especially after all the things they've been through. But to love a full-grown, wretched human being, that takes the love of God. So as you have your eyes closed for the sen sense of, pri of privacy, I want to ask this question. Can you play that music? Uh, I want to ask this question. Heaven has a voice. That's the, that voice of heaven is called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to persuade people. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to persuade. If I have preached from God's Holy Spirit today, then I have persuaded you about something. I've persuaded you about something. Not me as a person, but the Holy Spirit. That's how you know you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, because you're persuaded to be like God, like Jesus, to change some area of your life, to forgive a person who has wronged you for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and to say, I will no longer be in jail because of this person in my emotions. I will no longer be in prison because of this person in my head. I will no longer be the slave of this individual and let them beat me up emotionally by their behavior, language, or words. I'm coming out of jail today. And I'm going into paradise, the paradise of love, which makes me a supernatural person. I will no longer persecute those that despitefully use me but I will pray for them like Jesus said pray for those that despitefully use you I will become what God wants me to be heaven has a voice and that voice is speaking to each one of you about different things right now some of you you're, you're under conviction you're being convicted right now and say, you know, I, I don't love lost people. I never witness or share my, my faith with anyone. And, and what is the number one sign of disconnection from God? It's when you stop talking about God to strangers. 
Because the way you know you love someone is you talk about them. And when you stop talking about Jesus, you have stopped loving Jesus, even though you believe in him. And it is the love of God that keeps us in love with God and able to have love flow through and out of us. I need this message as bad as any human being on earth. But you are going to face eternity someday. And you may not get another chance other than today. Because some people are going to die this week somewhere on this earth. Somebody will die today somewhere that is not expecting to die. So I'm going to ask you a question that really is important and really matters. Can you say honestly that you are 100% sure that if you died today, you would go to heaven? Can you say, I have no doubt whatsoever that if I died today, no matter how, I would go to heaven? Because this is why you came today. If you're not 100% sure, then the Holy Spirit's job is to persuade you that He loves you no matter what you have done, no matter how mean or vile or painful or hurtful you have been, no matter what mistakes you have made and no matter what anyone has done to hurt you and make your heart like a rock, to put calluses on that heart towards certain people. It is the love of God that is in this room. It is the love of God that is in this building. It is the love of God that is convincing and persuading you. So I'm going to ask you to do a very easy thing and a very simple thing right there where you're sitting. That if you say, I'm not 100% sure that if I died today, I would go to heaven, but I want that. I don't want to leave this room without knowing that. All I'm going to ask you to do, if you want God to put that peace inside your heart, which no one else can do, and keep it there. If you want Him to do that, all I'm asking you to do right now, right there, is lift your hand high enough for me to see, and then I'm going to pray for you, and God is going to do a miracle for you. Oh my gosh, look at all those hands and stretch them out. Stretch them out where God can see it and everybody can see it. I see your hand there, and 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 there. I see your hands going up everywhere. It's a sincere act. It's a public act. All of heaven is watching. Because Jesus said something very powerful. If you are ashamed of me in front of people, I will be ashamed of you in front of my Father. But if you are not ashamed of me, then I will stand with you in front of my Father and confess your name to him as belonging to me. So everyone that lifted your hand, I just want you to stand right there, right now, right where you're at, and let me pray for you right now. Quickly stand to your feet if you lifted your hand, and let me pray for you right now. And we're going to settle this issue in your life, whoever you are and wherever you come from. I want to say to all of you that are standing a couple of things. There is nothing God cannot forgive. There is nothing God cannot forgive. You are not beyond redemption. As if you're in this building, you still have a chance. There have been a lot more bad people than you that God has forgiven. Paul used to murder people. He used to murder Christians. Or watch them murdered. And other people have done many terrible things. But it's from the ashes that God builds a divine life. 
Now, all of you that are standing, would you look at me for a second? Play that again. Would you look at me for a second? May I have your permission to pray for you? May I have your permission, all of you? May I, your servant, may I pray for you? Would you allow me to look into your face when I talk to you and lead you in this prayer? I will not make you say anything to anybody. But if I can, would you come forward just for a second? Would you give them a hand as they come up here? Just walk up here. And I want you to clap for them like the, your mother is up, coming up here. Just walk up here real quick. I just want to look at you and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I won't make you say anything to anybody, but I want to, I want to pray for you and, and um, see your face. So if you know any of these people this morning, if you know them, then I want you to stretch your hands out towards him as a sign of, of compassion. And once more, before I do this, I do want to ask, I think there's a couple more of you that didn't raise your hand. For whatever reasons, you know, people want to do it, that sometimes they're too embarrassed or too shy, or, but they want to, but they just can't. Their pride is in the way or fear, whatever it may be. Uh, I just do, do want to say to you that at any time that I'm praying right now, if you want to get up and come up here, it will be the best thing that you have ever done to heal your own life. To be at peace with God is like discovering the cure for all diseases and injecting it into your body at one time. And now you become immune to many things. Public confession of a need for God opens the windows of heaven and sends down the blessings of God. So, if there's anyone else that said, I wish I had come up there, I know this would take a lot of bravery, but, you know, we're not supposed to be cowards. If you are not sure, if you have any doubt at all, now would be the time to get up and come forward with these people and say, I should have gotten up and gone up there. And then I'll wait for you for just a little bit and see if anybody else would like to do that. Would you stretch your hands out towards these people? And if you know them, kind of aim your hand as a blessing hand towards them. And let me say to all of you that came up here a couple of important things. Not everybody that you ask to forgive you is going to do it. Some people are actually going to say to you, I'm not going to forgive you. Ever. And you're going to have to live with that. It's a terrible feeling. Because people want to be forgiven. Especially if they genuinely change. They want to be forgiven. But some people won't forgive you. Others will forgive you. They'll really try to forgive you. But the next time you do something, everything they forgave you for, they'll bring it up again just like they didn't forgive you. I was driving here this morning from church. And I thought about something in the past that somebody did, and I felt the feelings coming up in me. Things I already had forgiven people for, but I felt them coming up again. And so I said, oh, God, I just forgive them again right now. And then they left. Because, you know, <laughs> we're human beings, ladies and gentlemen. It's difficult to forget, even if you want to. God has to help you. But God is not the way we are. This is the confidence that we can have and these people can have. Whatever you've done that makes you doubt that you'll go to heaven or makes you afraid or, or makes you still feel guilty or anything, God doesn't just forgive, but God erases what you've done from His very memory. It actually doesn't exist in His mind anymore, and you're totally free. This is what gives you a, the ability to actually get up and leave this building in a minute and say, wait a minute. 
Are you telling me that I'm free for all that? Yeah, you're free from that. And God doesn't remember. God doesn't remember. You mean I don't have... God, uh, God is not going to kill me in the next couple of days because of what? I, no, God's not going to kill you because you've paid. The price was paid at the cross for those sins. You can't pay it. God paid it. But you can forgive yourself because if you don't, then what good does it do what God did? You have to receive the forgiveness of God. Praise the Lord. Would you stretch your hands out to this gentleman right here? And tell me your name, sir. Yeah. I need to pray for your sugar, the blood sugar, diabetes, different things in, in the body, sir. I, I just really need to pray for God to heal you right now before I get going. Would you all stretch your hand? Lord, we pray for the reversal of that in his body. In the name of Jesus, God, everything going on in that body, that you'll heal it and prevent serious uh, damage to his body, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's all pray now together. Everybody pray together. Say, Dear God in heaven, forgive me for everything that I have ever done. I repent, I apologize, and I turn my back on Satan, on the devil, and on his plan for my life. Wherever he has made me like him, I renounce it. In the name of Jesus. I don't want to hurt anybody. Use anybody. Exploit anybody. Or hate anybody. I just want to be famous. For loving people. Without bias. And without condition. Till the day I die. May I be a safe place. That bad people can be. Without being destroyed. In the name of Jesus. I ask you, God, to come and live in my heart. Cleanse me with your blood. Write my name in the book of life. Take all my doubts away. And thank you, Lord, that I am persuaded that I am forgiven and I can have a new life and walk in the goodness of God for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all turn around for one minute? Just turn around and face the church. Ladies and gentlemen, can I present to you some good people with a good future who God has forgiven, washed and cleansed and purified, and put some hope in there, saved or unsaved before, they're going to walk with God now, and we empower them with the Holy Spirit, and most of all, Make it your aim in life that these people, when they're around you, will feel like they are being celebrated and they have dignity and worth and can live a good life in the future. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand and you all may be seated. God bless you. Everybody, thank you so much. Pastor Robert is coming up here. Praise the Lord. God bless. Well, praise God. Ushers, help me. Let's take up an offering. We're going to be taking up an offering tonight also for Brother Ivan if you weren't prepared. But come on, we're going to, we're going to bless them. So if you need an offering envelope, lift up your hands. Ushers will get you one. Sowing into the lives of all those kids. You know, and, and, and I hope that they don't die before I do because I want him to have to do my funeral. Um. You know, but I, he's right. Those kids down there, we're going to take care of them forever. As long as I'm on the face of the earth, we're going to be rescuing kids. Amen. There's nothing more, more uh, I know is a mandate of a call of God on my life than to rescue orphans. And uh, it's the greatest, greatest thing in the world. Amen. So praise God. Put your hand on your offering. Father, I just declare right now that we are the wealthiest people on the face of the earth. I declare that we're the largest blessers that there ever was. I thank you, Lord God, that to, even today... As we give and as we sow into this ministry, I declare, Lord God, that not only is our agreement set with it, but Lord, you begin to work miracles and signs and wonders within our own finances and our own lives and begin to bless and to bless us and to bless us and to bless us, Lord, so that we can be those blessings. So, Father, I thank you right now for your hand upon this offering, hand upon this church, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. 
Praise God. Look at the person beside you and say, man, I can't wait to get back at 630. And they look at him real strong and say, you're really coming back, right? You're not just saying that. Praise God. Well, I pray that you are blessed this morning. Can walk in the love of God. Oh, don't forget the book. We have the book table put out over there with all the their products you need to pick up. Some of the products to just keep going. And uh, so it's all right over there. Abby's at the table. So stand up. Praise the Lord. All right. Grab that person's hand beside you there. Father, I declare right now in the name of Jesus, I declare, Lord God, that we're walking out of here with a desire, an intense desire to walk in the love of God. To, to understand and to grasp it and everything that was preached this morning that we absorb it, get it down into our hearts, get it into our minds and into our souls. That, Lord, we will be a church of love. We will be people that approach everything in life in the love of God. Lord, we thank you for the love of God that's been directed towards us, and it's our desire to direct it towards others. So, Lord, we just thank you for it. Bless them, Lord God, and bring us all back again together tonight for another Holy Ghost meeting. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you, church.